Hey guys, this is John Rivera from the Solid State Gamer bringing you guys another quick look in our, our little series here. Uh, this time we're going to be looking at a classic. Uh, it's a launch title for the original Sony PlayStation and it's one that's dear to my heart. And no, it's not Galaga. It's funny, every time I play this game I've got this image mentally burnt into my head for, for all eternity. It's, a, it's an oldie, but a goodie. And it's Ridge Racer for the Sony PlayStation. I can't tell you how nostalgic this game is for me. This this is, the image has been permanently implanted in my head. This is actually the first game that I played for the PlayStation. When uh, our stepdad brought this game and the system in. I remember seeing the system and the game that it was, ha you know, the case that the game was housed in. It's the case was huge. You know, this is back when PlayStation games were being packaged in those long boxes. They were either made out of cardboard, uh, an amalgamation of cardboard and plastic, or you had those large jewel cases like you saw with the North American Sega Saturn games. And I just remember being very intimidated by the PlayStation because it was this larger than life piece of hardware that I'd never seen before. It looked somewhat familiar the controller kind of felt like a super nes controller but that was where the similarities ended you know the first thing i thought to myself like where do the cartridges go in and, and my stepfather said to me no no just like pcs this game system uses you know compact discs for games and I'm like, wow that's really interesting you know you look at the and you look at the cd itself and the cds had like a black underside to them and it was just it was different from anything you ever saw before and again it was kind of intimidating i didn't know what to expect and i popped the game in and experienced that little loading screen with the galaga game and i was like oh this is kind of weird but it's interesting i love galaga and then like that loading screen it faded into the namco logo proudly displaying it showing like not only the humble beginnings of the company but what they had become as of 1995 when this game came out and I was completely blown away. Uh, so let's just get through this. That way we can just get to the game. So this is just a fast lap thing. You can load or save your memory card um, information that shows your best times. This is just uh, your controller configuration screen. You can switch between four different layouts from A to B. I prefer A. It's pretty standard and, and self-explanatory. And uh, this is a music player. I mean... The soundtrack for this game is, in my opinion, phenomenal. It, it just it has this sense of exhilaration when, when coupled with the thrill of racing in the game. It's unbelievable. It's just like classic mid-90s Japanese club music. And it's kind of an interesting, refreshing change of pace. Or at least I felt like it was at the time. Uh, compared to games like Destruction Derby 1 and 2, you know, a lot of these Western developed racing games where they used pretty much like generic 90s butt rock to kind of lay down, you know, the, I guess, a bed of music over your racing action, which, you know, if I'm in the mood for it, it's okay, but I always felt that this soundtrack was something you could pop into your, your CD player in your car and just, I mean, it, it'll make you speed. It, it will make you put the pedal to the metal. And uh, that's something that it's, it's something to credit the music for. That it actually embodies that exhilaration of, of traveling at high speeds. Anyway. So let's just get into this. So you can select between manual automatic transmission. And, uh, you know, switching gears is accomplished by pressing the L and R1 buttons. Um, R for up and L for down. Pretty, like I said, pretty explanatory controls. Um, you can select your car. There's a difference between these two cars, which are grip cars. You can see right here uh, the little layout showing the handling over the, the traction, acceleration, and the maximum speed. And then here you have your muscle cars. Now, a little Easter egg in this game, or I guess a little secret, in that little Galaga minigame, if you can manage to shoot down every single uh, enemy ship, 
then what happens is you can unlock the entire uh, bestiary of cars that you race against in, in the track and you can select them as a car to race as. So you can even play as the demon car which uh, is named in the manual. It's like this demon car which I mean it's got the highest max speed and highest acceleration. It's just a beast of a machine. But I'm gonna pick the standard Namco car because it's just it's one of my favorite cars. It has just solid handling and stuff. It doesn't have the best max speed or acceleration but for beginners, it is the perfect car to use. And you can select your music track right here. This is the track selection. Now, with all this, you can tell that there's not a lot of content in this game. But the other side of the coin in that regard is that once the game has loaded, using that, I guess, that little sequence with the Galaga minigame or the metagame, the game is completely loaded into RAM. And so there's no loading times with this title, which there's something to be said for that. You can just get into the game and that's all there is to it. Uh, it's not like other racing games where you have to like pick your car, pick all the parts that go into it, uh, you know, adjust the tires, the handling and stuff. No, you, you pick a car that is, is perfect for your play style and you just get into the game and you race. And that's something I've always loved about the Ridge Racer series. It's, it's never it's never been a terribly complicated game. It's always been a very arcadey sort of experience. And again, there's something to be said for that. Something that's, you know, simple, self-explanatory. You know, this is essentially like, you know, the, the NFL Blitz of racing game series. You know, NFL Blitz is a great football game, but it's not a simulation game that uses advanced physics. I mean, they're very archaic physics. And the gameplay is very rudimentary, but it captures that notion of playing the sport. Much like this game captures the, the thrill of racing. And that's always been a tenet of the Ridge Racer series. So, let's just get into it. Three, two, Trying to get a good start out of here. As you saw, that was the Ridge Racer girl. She appears, she appears in every single Ridge Racer game. <laughs> and that announcer. This was not just the era of very solid arcadey sort of shallow but fun racing games, but this was also the time of like absurdly obnoxious uh, announcers and narrators. So as you can tell, I'm not really traveling all that fast. A, because I've got a grip car, and C, or B, because this beginner mode, it kind of captures max speed. So I just engaged in a drift right there. Drifting in this game is very easy, but it's kind of funky. Like when you engage into a drift, your your vertical position on the track like stays the same, if you will, but you have to pretty much just recenter your vehicle so that way it's parallel with the track. So that way you can get out of the drift and I guess, you know, get out of it. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's just it's a weird system, but it does just somehow work. And it never really deviates from that formula. God, this music is so good. Oh. As you can see, <laughs> the, the physics in this game are very <laughs> rudimentary to say the least. But that's never really been the focus of, of these sort of racing games. Like, for example, like Daytona USA, Ridge Racer, Virtual Racing. They, I mean, well, Virtual Racer was uh, racing was the first game to really kind of try real world physics. Not really as advanced as something like the original Gran Turismo for the Sony PlayStation. But that was kind of like a paradigm shift and kind of just a, a mentality shift in the development of racing games. Uh, out of all the genres of gaming, I would say that racing games have had the largest amount of evolutionary changes throughout the entire genre's history. Like, it wasn't just the transition from, you know, 2D tunnel racers that kind of used uh, scan lines to, you know, shifting scan lines to represent the track. It... <laughs> that announcer. But... The shift to 3D was not enough. I mean, it, it was... The 3D era was kind of flooded with these games, and, and you also had the Destruction Derby series, 
that also kind of pushed the genre forward in the sense that it 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 got better physics you know physics rules down uh the notion of gravity hitting jumps and stuff which this game really never understood as well as destruction derby one and two and then later on you had games like the driver series made by the same people who made destruction derby and they've got their physics engine down a little better where you know the gravity was much better you had uh more of an emphasis on traction on the road. Oh, we had a little bit of slowdown right there. I guess when there's a lot of vehicles populating that, that area right there, uh, around a turn, it, it, it'll kind of chug a little bit at a slower pace. There we go. Watch yourself! <laughs> this guy. But the thing is, that even though the gameplay of this game is very shallow for, you know, by today's standards, it's still a very tight game. It, it doesn't feel like it, it's flawed in any sense, except for the fact that the, the physics aren't necessarily all that realistic. But you can't really expect that from an arcade sort of game. Like, anything that's made for the arcade format, it's kind of meant to capture the feeling of whatever you're supposed to be doing but not necessarily realistically handle it like like what you just saw right there if I mean if this were a game like destruction derby I would have drifted out of control and hit a wall I would have had to recenter myself on the road possibly go, go in you know reverse but this is just not how Ridge Racer was handled I, I guess their mentality behind the game was just uh, that sort of thing would just slow the game down so it just made the the collision and the physics that govern the game uh, focus towards moving forward. And uh, like I said, not realistic, but it it's consistent. And the game just runs tight as a result. Okay. Now, I know I'm kind of bumping into everything. <laughs> you know, uh, it's hard to play racing games that you know, require reaction time and stuff, and talk at the same time, so I, please do forgive my shoddy gameplay. If, if I were just concentrating straight up, it would not be that big of a deal, so. But if you look at this game, I mean, just, I mean, this was 19, this is early 1995 for the PlayStation. Launch title, you look at just, this is the only racetrack that you see in the game, but you see all these set dressings, like you see this helicopter that's hovering overhead, all these advertisements and stuff, you know, the lighting that changes with this tunnel that you go through. It's just a well-wrought scenery. It's just that coupled with the music and just the tight racing mechanics, it just it feels right. There's just nothing stupid about this game. Except for the announcer. <laughs> You're the greatest. <laughs> but Something really interesting about this game is it, it, it really did make me think about the future of gaming in a way that a lot of games back then never really did, except for maybe like Doom or Star Fox, games that were kind of like dipping their toe in modern 3D. When I played this game for the first time, I thought to myself, whoa, this is incredible. I mean... This is it. This is this is as great as gaming is going to get. Like it can't. It, there's no way. I thought to myself, there is no way it can possibly get better than this. I mean, this it looks beautiful. It plays incredibly well. You know, I, I'm bopping my head to the music. I mean, there's just no way it could possibly get better than this. I thought to myself. And again, you know, I was very young when this game came out. And. I, it's just like, you just think to yourself, it's like when you see the next generation of sports games, and every time you say to yourself, oh, they just, they look exactly like the real thing. I mean, of course, when you look at it in hindsight, you're just like, mm. <laughs> it's kind of silly to think that, but, you know, for Ridge Racer, I, I really, I really thought that this was as, this was like the top echelon, it, it, that it could not possibly get better than this. 
And the same thing with Tekken. When I when I played that game for the first time, I mean, that's for that that's a discussion for another time. But I mean, I was just awestruck with the first lineup, you know, of, of launch titles for the for the PlayStation. It's just like it, it it can't get any better. How how could it possibly get more advanced and more realistic than this? And that's how I felt. I, I just felt like the, it, it. It's like there was just a peak that that could not be exceeded. That like we had reached the plateau of technology, and I, I knew, I knew that it was going to get a you know a little better, but at least for the PlayStation's sake, and maybe other respective platforms that came out after it. But it was just an awe factor. I mean, I was just, it was just intimidating how, how incredible these games looked and just how they played. You know, this, along with other games like Warhawk and Twisted Metal, Battle Arena, Toshinden, the original Wipeout is another game that just made me, you know, we have some line breakage right there. <laughs> this was before the uh, PlayStation Performance Analyzer came out um, uh, due to Polyphony Digital's combined efforts with SCEA or Sony Computer Entertainment of Japan uh, making a dev, a dev kit that was actually able to do away with errors like line breaks and stuff like that. But these were the early days and you, you, you were kind of willing to forgive stuff like that because first of all you've never seen anything quite like this before. You, I mean, oh, you see the pop in too, like the draw distance is not terribly impeccable but for the time it was. No one had ever seen a 3D experience like this that had such a great draw distance for the time. Let's see if I can get one up on this car. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm like redlining right now. I always thought that was so cool whenever you hit a jump and, and you hear the screeching of your tires and stuff. Just, I mean, the, every element of this game works together to just make you feel like you're really driving in, a, you know, a high-end, you know, sports car. Not a sports car, but just like race car, you know, actually feeling the thrill of the race and like actually passing oncoming, you know, uh, other vehicles in the distance. I, I can't tell you how nostalgic this was for me, or, and still is for me. Whenever I play this game, I always go back to, you know, however old I was when this game came out, and it just. I just go back to 1995. As soon as I pop this game in, I, I, I can't tell you how, how memorable this was as, as an experience for me, and how it just made me look toward the future of gaming to, to what we have now. It's it. At first, it might you know from the outset, it might seem silly that this game was like a, a milestone. It, it, re it really was though. It it really pushed the genre forward and kind of showed the potential of what else could be done with it in in the 3D in the 3D realm. I mean, this is getting past like I said all the the scan line interpolated uh, racing games of old that were sprite based and. Also, the Mode 7 games like Mario Kart, as well as the original F-Zero, which was a milestone in itself, but this game just blew it away by a mile, I would say. I love this game. I love everything about it. Let's see. If, let's do this time trial track. I believe in this track, you only face up against the demon car, and it's at nighttime. Ooh. go and there we go <laughs> I just used the shortcomings of the engine to my advantage <laughs> see if I can drift all the way around this yep there we go and if you stay in your drift for too long obviously you're gonna lose you're gonna lose some speed
as you can see right there, if you look in the replays and stuff and you see yourself drifting, it's not realistic at all. Like, you can see your car manipulating in a fashion that is, like, not true to life, like, real-world physics. It was just kind of hilarious, but, again, this was, like, 1995, and you couldn't really expect a lot. Oh, it just got passed. Oh, no! And you see the changing of the, you know, the... the the day to night cycle it's just it's really impressive it, this game was really a, a, a really impressive display a technical display of what the PlayStation was was capable of doing and this was just a launch title and of course we all know that PlayStation's PlayStation's titles got really really good uh, at the end of its lifespan during the early aughts like 2000 2001 you look at the PlayStation games that came out at that point and it's almost unbelievable to think that it began with games like this, but it, it really did. And that's just kind of a testament to the platform as, as a whole and just the, the wide breadth of experiences that were available to the player. And this was a system that had pretty much anything you wanted. Kind of stole the RPG crown from, from Nintendo for a while because of the fact that, you know, it was a system that was easy to develop for and, and had a huge storage capacity with using CDs. And I'm gonna get passed again. Uh, <laughs> it's the last stretch, hang in there. This nice little sunset sort of lighting happening with the scenery. It's just it's just a beautiful game. Like if you can put your mind into the time frame of 1995 when you play this game, like you'll really appreciate how beautiful of a game it really is. And they just they just spared no spared no expense when it came to just bringing as much detail as they could into this. I mean, really, honestly, this is kind of a technical showcase. And it's a pretty damn good one, I would say. Honestly, I love this game so much, I not only bought the long... I not only have the long box version, but I also have the re-release. The Greatest Hits re-release. It's the final stretch. Floor it. Yeah! It's a new record! And with that, guys... That concludes my quick look into Ridge Racer, uh, early generation title, launch title for the PlayStation 1, and you know what? It's been 20 plus years, but it's still a fun game. Anyway, with all that said, I'm your host John Rivera saying thank you guys for watching hope you guys enjoyed this little snippet of gameplay i.e the entire regular campaign of ridge racer one and hope you guys enjoyed and i hope you guys if you guys have any nostalgia for this game and have a similar experience playing this game along with you know other early generation playstation one games that just made you just kind of dazzled you and, and put stars in your eyes thinking about what the future of gaming could hold for all of us not just in terms of the technology but in terms of the wide breadth of different types of gaming experiences that that could be made available you know with the unveiling of this technological showcase of gameplay that that is this title be sure to let me know i mean uh, i that's that's what we strive to do here at the solid state gamer it's all about not just you know critiquing games and stuff but just sharing our love for the medium itself and and having an appreciation for the history and and these these little milestones that have been made throughout the annals of gaming history and that have led their way to this grand industry that grosses more money than almost the music and film industries combined you know and and you know, here we go and and what and, and what it means what it personally means to you you know 
that's really the big deal. It's not just it's not just you pushing the buttons, and it, it, you know to play the game. It's it's how it's how that game pushes your buttons, and th that's something that's always really fascinated me, and something I, that's made me come back to gaming time and time again. And uh, you know, I wouldn't give this love up for anything. So anyway, thanks again. And uh, we'll see you next time. As always, I'm your host, John Rivera, signing off for the Solid State Gamer Quick Look Series.